Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of Philippians 3.8. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. <clears throat> the whole verse says, yes, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And the King James says, I count them as dung. They're so utterly useless to me. They're, they're cow dung. They're feces. Now this, you can take this and you can go and you can read Ecclesiastes and start to get a little more insight into why Solomon said vanity of vanity, all is vanities. It's all useless. It doesn't serve God. It only serves us. Paul counted everything that he was. And he was. He had a lot. He had Roman citizenship and Jewish citizenship. He studied at the best schools of that time. The man was a Pharisee of Pharisees. There was no one that was better than him. And he says, none of that matters. That's all junk. That's all useless refuse. I can't do anything with it. Because the knowledge of Christ Jesus is so much more important. So let's get some context here. I'm going to go up to verse 1. Righteousness through faith in Christ. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Constant reminders. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Beware of the circumcision. Because even back then they were trying to stop this. They were trying to destroy this movement of Christianity. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So they are not, we are. Now, some people misunderstand this verse. And they say, hey, that's that shows that we've replaced Israel. No, no, no. No, no, no. Don't misunderstand. The reason why he's using these terms, mutilation, isn't because of the physical that's been happened. Is because the spiritual. For them to be circumcised was mutilation. For us to be circumcised, it is Christ. But that's a circumcision of the heart. So we have to be careful how we read this. And we have to be careful how we understand this. Not with a knee-jerk reaction, but actually dig a little deeper into it and see what he's actually referring to here. So a lot of people misuse that verse 3. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, verse 4, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. If confidence in the flesh was a thing, he had more than anyone a right to have confidence in the flesh. But it's not. See, that's what uh, unbelieving Israel is doing. They have confidence in the flesh. We don't have confidence in the flesh. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul was perfect physically. In the flesh, he was the perfect example. And it was useless. Verse 7, but, with, but what things were gained to me, have these I have counted as loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you throw everything away and go out and live on the streets to gain Christ. You gain Christ through faith. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. So this is the point of what Paul is trying to express here. I don't want what I am as my righteousness. I want what he is as my righteousness. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That's an imputed righteousness. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death. If by any means 
I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So he's telling us how this works and, and how he's doing it. He still had those things. But they were nothing compared to the Lord and the righteousness and holiness that are imputed unto us through faith in the Lord. So we still have our things, but they're nothing to us compared to him. And he's making the comparison. A lot of people, when they read these first 11 verses, really get them misunderstood. Got to pay attention to what he's saying here. Straining toward the goal, verse 12, not that I have already attained which we haven't, and he didn't either at that time, and I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Guys, we haven't been perfected yet. A lot of people would have you believe that's it. Once you believe you're perfected, not yet. It hasn't happened yet. There's a day of redemption where that perfection is manifested. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, some people might say, well, but it says we're already seated in heavenly places. True. Are you physically there? No. Then you haven't apprehended it yet. There's a time coming for that. Paul understood this. He realized in Christ, I'm safe. In Christ, I, I'm in Christ. I have all these things. Yet, I haven't apprehended it yet because I'm not there physically. His physical form had not arrived at that state. Even when we meet our appointed time to die and pass on, and we go and we wait in heaven with the Lord, we still haven't apprehended it because we haven't apprehended it in the body. That's something that's coming. That's a that's actually an integral part. Is to to apprehend those things and to have those things in the body, but it has to be a new body because we can't have those things in this physical form. We can't handle it. Heaven is too strong and too powerful, and no sin resides in heaven, and we have sin in our flesh. So that time is coming. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, whatever that may be, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join me in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now he's talking about those who supposedly are believers. But they pervert the gospel, pervert our freedom. They pervert these things. You and I have seen it happen here on YouTube. We've seen it happen in churches. Whose end is destruction? whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. They glory in their own shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So there's a lot. He's warning about the people that are within what is called the church today. And they, a lot of them have been exposed. A lot of that's happened here recently. There's been a bunch of them that have been exposed. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's when we will have taken hold of it. It's a good chapter. <laughs> Spiritual knowledge of Christ will be a personal knowledge. I cannot know Jesus through another person's acquaintance with him. You don't get in on a group discount. It doesn't work that way. No, I must know him myself. I must know him on my own account. It will be an intelligent knowledge. I must know him, not as the visionary dreams of him, but as the word reveals him. This is where the Bible is key you don't know Jesus until you know him as the word has described him. I must know his natures, divine and human. I must know his offices, his attributes, his works, his shame, his glory. I must meditate upon him until I comprehend with all saints 
what is the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. It's interesting that he says that. I, he says that I need to know the love of Christ, which is not able to be known. The love of Christ surpasses our knowledge, surpasses our understanding. It will be an affectionate knowledge of him. It's a deep connection. It's a love. It's a, it's a literal connection. Indeed, if I know him at all, I must love him. And how do we love the Lord? We love each other. An ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ton of head learning. Remember what I said the uh, last couple of days? A lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches, and that's from the forehead to the heart. An ounce of heart knowledge is worth a ton of head knowledge. Our knowledge of him will be a satisfying knowledge. It, it all starts in the word with head knowledge, but it grows into heart knowledge as we learn more about him. We learn more from his word. Our knowledge of him will be a satisfying knowledge. When I know my Savior, my mind will be full to the brim. I shall feel that I have that which my spirit panted after. This is that bread, whereof if a man eat, he shall never hunger. At the same time, it will be an exciting knowledge. The more I know of my beloved, the more I shall want to know. The higher I climb, the loftier will be the summits, which invite my eager footsteps. This guy understands the whole climbing the mountain to get to the Lord thing, paddling upstream to find the source. I shall want, I shall want the more as I get the more. So the more I get, the more I'm going to want. Like the miser's treasure, my gold will make me covet more. We want to know more about the Lord. We want to know more about his will. We want to know more about what he's doing. To conclude, this knowledge of Christ Jesus will be a most happy one. In fact, so elevating that sometimes it will completely bear me up above all trials and doubts and sorrows. And it will, while I enjoy it, make me something more than man that is born of woman who is a few days and full of trouble. For it will fling about me the immortality of the ever-living Savior and gird me with the golden girdle of his eternal joy. Come, my soul, sit at Jesus' feet and learn of him all this day. How do we do that? Read the Bible. It's all contained in there. How many times have, have I shared things with you guys and, you're, and you commented, or you even didn't comment, but thought to yourself, I never saw that before. Yeah. I never saw it before either until the Lord revealed it to me. This is what the Bible is, is that it's a book that's always showing you something new. It's always teaching you something. It's always revealing something to you. It's okay to study other books, but this has to be the focus. This book must be the core. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? We can't go anywhere else and expect to find the answers. The only book we are ever going to learn about the character of Christ is right here in this book. Now, other people write books about the Lord, but are you getting the, the actual information from their book? No, you're getting their view of him, their interpretation of the text. You're getting their level of understanding. So the book's about them, not about him. This book is about Christ. This book is centered on Christ. Our timeline is centered on Christ. Why do you think the Lord was born when everything went from AD or everything went from BC to AD? Because his life is that zero year. Everything from him goes backwards and goes forwards. Both, both ends of our history point to the Lord. Everything in the past pointed forward to the Lord. Everything now points back to the, to the Lord. He's the center of it all. That moment in human history 2,000 years ago was the center of all things. <laughs> And the only way you know about all this is from this book. 
The only way we can understand or know his character is from this book. The only way we can grasp his the reality of his being is from this book. The only way we can understand his thoughts and how he looked at things is from this book. You can't get that from anywhere else. You can only get it from here. And so anything else that we are, anything else that we have, anything else that we do is nothing compared to the knowledge of the Lord. There are many of us, I, I venture a guess, I know I'm one of them, that if somebody provided everything and took care of everything, we would push everything away and just focus on the Bible. Anytime anybody saw us, we'd be reading scripture. But there's things that need to be done. There are distractions in this world. There's responsibilities in this world. And the Lord understands that. But I think if we were given, and I always, the way I picture it myself personally, is I go to sleep and I wake up and I'm in this valley surrounded by mountains. And there, and I'm in a cabin and it's it's backed up to a little grove of trees. And there's a river that runs right through it. It never rains, it never floods. The weather's always perfect. Every day, new provisions are always in the, in the cabinets. I don't have to worry about food because the food self replenishes. And I sit there and enjoy creation and read the Bible. I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on, but that's where I am. And I can't get out. The mountains are too high to climb over. There's no valleys. But I realize, and I had a dream about this once, but I realize I don't want to leave. And so I read the Bible. And I read it, and I read it, and I read it. Everything that we have in this life is from the Lord. Everything we have that's a blessing to us, everything we have that we use, our skills, all the, everything, and it's all from the Lord. But none of that matters if we don't have the Lord. None of that serves us at all unless we have Jesus Christ. Look at other people around the world. Look at what they have. Does it do them any good? Does it serve them any purpose? Nope. Because they don't have the Lord. It does nothing for them. I saw a, um, a guy that he had some kind of weird business that he had gotten going. And I, I think some of it might have been <laughs> secretly theft. Anyway, big business mogul. And he built a $26 million penthouse. So it was a building that was built and a penthouse was built on top. Multiple floors. He had his car collection. He had his one-of-a-kind custom-made car. Couldn't get it legal. Couldn't drive it on the street. It wasn't allowed. And so he paid for crane operators to lift that car up and put it in his in his penthouse. All that money. And he couldn't couldn't buy the one thing he wanted the most, which was to take that car out and go drive it. So it has to sit in his in his penthouse as an art piece. All that money it did him no good. All the money in the world it it literally does him no good. There's a time coming when everybody in the world is going to realize that they're going to have, they got all this stuff stored up. They got all these provisions and supplies. They got all this money stored away. They got all their investments. And there's a time coming when it's all going to get taken away. When it's all going to become so utterly worthless that they're just going to walk out in the street and throw their hands up in the air and go, I got nothing. None of that stuff does any good without Jesus Christ. Faith in God is worthless faith without Jesus Christ. Going to church is useless without Jesus Christ. Standing in a pulpit and preaching is nothing. It's empty words without Jesus Christ. The gospel is not the gospel without Jesus Christ. Heaven is not heaven without Jesus Christ. So, count it all dung. It's all dung. It's all refuse. It's all trash. It's all useless. 
if I don't have Christ. So I have to have Christ first. And that starts right here in this book. There is not a single person who has come to faith in Jesus Christ without the Bible. I'm not talking about fake faith. I'm talking about genuine faith. There's a lot of people out there who don't have genuine faith. It's a false faith. And every one of them got it outside of Scripture. In fact, a lot of them deny the Scripture openly and admittingly. There's one guy that's supposed to be a pastor. Him and his wife say that the Bible is the book of the devil. Okay, then how did you know to come to faith? Uh, the Holy Spirit told me. How do you know it's the right Holy Spirit? See, if you don't have the book that shows you what to look for, you don't know what you got. Without the Lord, without the book, we have nothing. That's why John made that point so clear. To, to change, he added a few words to Genesis 1, in the beginning. But John said in the beginning was the Word, because he was talking about Christ, because it centered on Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's Christ. He is the Word. This book is Christ in writing. You want to know what the narrow path and the narrow gate is? Look at your Bible. It's his way. And so everything else is nothing. Everything else we have, it's nothing without him. It's useless without him. It's valueless without him. So faith without Christ is nothing. Belief without Christ is nothing. That causes you to look at a whole lot of religions out there that claim to follow God, but don't because they take Christ out of it. Well, that all what you've built without Christ is nothing. The Vatican, a lot of Catholic churches, there's even some Baptist churches, some Pentecostal churches, some Episcopalian churches, some Lutheran churches, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. Well, they all mention him, but they push him to the side. Excuse me, Jesus, I'm going after this. Um, you need me to get to that. It's nothing without Christ. And so in order for us to genuinely have those things, we have to have Christ. He's the head of the church. You want to know the truth? You want to find out everything? You want to, you want to know who the head honcho is? You want to go to the boss? Give me your supervisor? It's Jesus Christ. Because he is the intermediary for us to, to the Father. Without Christ, you have nothing. With Christ, you have everything. If you have Christ, you have everything. Because he is our all in all. He is our everything. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word, and thank you for this devotion. It is remarkable to me that there are so many today who claim to have faith in you and yet don't believe in you. They say they do, but they don't because they miss the one thing they need more than anything. You. Well, I believe in God. I'm not talking about God. I'm not talking about the Father. I'm talking about the Son. If you have the Son, you have the Father. You can't have either one without the other. And yet that's what they try to do to you. It's an insult. It's insulting that they try to push you to the side. And there's a lot of them that do it. I'm going to go to, straight to the source. He is the source. From the Father, through the Son to us. But people move you to the side, Lord. They don't, want, they don't want you to be in the way. They want to do everything they can to move you out of the way. Because they know you're the authority. They know all things have been put under your control. All things are in your hands. They know this. That's why you have these stupid protesters going around or carrying out big old signs. Bring Jesus back. We'll kill him again. Um, no, you won't. They don't know what kind of condemnation they call down on themselves. But I find it interesting that they put that on that sign, which shows there's a level of faith there. Otherwise, why would they fight against you? They know you're real. I said that to atheists before. The only reason why you guys are so adamant about fighting against Christianity is because you know it's true. That's why you're fighting it. Otherwise, we don't fight against anything we know is false. That's why they don't go after Islam. That's why they don't go after Krishna. That's why they don't go after Buddha. That's why they don't go after any other religion. They know that those are false. They know Christianity is true. That's why they fight it. That's why they hate it. 
So they know you're true. They know you're real, but they're trying to ignore you. And the, the greater insult comes from those who claim to have faith in you and follow you. And there are a great many out there. Now, some within these groups are yours, and you're going to call them out and get them where they're supposed to be. But we have Jehovah's Witnesses. We have Mormons. We have many different denominations that fall in this category outside of others within that denomination, Lutherans, Episcopalians, on and on and on, to include the Vatican. They claim to be the religion that follows you, yet they don't. They, mo they move you to the side. They ignore you. Many of them pose as themselves as Christian organizations. Knights of Columbus, it's not a Christian organization, it's demonic. Masons, not a Christian organization, demonic. Shriners, not a Christian organization, demonic. A lot of people are like, wait, what? The Shriners? Yep. The guys with the Fez and little go-kart? Yep. If you knew the history behind what the Fez was, you would understand. That hat was worn by an individual way back that killed a whole bunch of Christians and then dipped the hat in blood. And that Fez is a symbol of Christian death. All of these organizations, when you get to the highest level, you're forced to have to worship Satan. So, demonic. They claim to follow you, yet they don't. It's a facade. It's fake. What nonsense. And they do that because they want everything. Not realizing everything they have is nothing without you. The one thing they need, the one key ingredient they need, and that's the one that they exclude. It's like making a recipe where the key ingredient, banana, banana nut bread, it's something everybody can understand. Here's banana nut bread, but it's got no bananas in it. Well, then it's just bread. I saw somebody, what were they making? Um, meatless pork ribs. Well, then they're not pork ribs. So, Lord, every time they try to take you out of the equation, they make the biggest mistake that they ever could make. Everything else may be right on point, but that's the one thing they need above all else. We can do everything we can do to follow along with whatever religion does. Without you, it's nothing. It's worthless. It's useless. Without you, my abilities to work on cars and fix things and do this and do that is nothing. Without you, this life that I'm living is nothing. It will result in nothing without you, that's for sure. Lord, we need you. You are the catalyst. I can take a, a medium and I can mix it up. And it, 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 it's supposed, the whole point is that it would gelatinize because we're going to encase some stuff in it to protect it and make it basically a rubberized coating. That sounds great, but if you don't have the catalyst, it never solidifies. Concrete. Sand, some powders, a couple other little things. That's all great. Mix it up with water and dump it in a hole. It never gets hard. Why? You forgot the catalyst. You forgot the hardener. The wicking agent that draws the moisture out that makes it solidify. Does no good. You can't drive a car with no gas in it. That's the catalyst. Can't fly an airplane without wings. And so we take everything in our life and we look, okay, so let me take one key ingredient out and let's see what happens. Failure, and, and that's everything in life. Without you, everything we have and everything we are is nothing. So Lord, we need you. We need you. You must be involved in everything because you are involved in everything. None of this came to pass without you. You created it all. The Bible tells us this. Nothing was made that was made. Nothing that was made was made without your hands. You were the one that did it. That gives us a, a peek into your character. It's not by accident that you were born into a family that were carpenters.
It's not by accident that you gave the design for the new temple that will be in the Millennial Ring. I think we're going to find that if we walk around the streets of New Jerusalem, we're going to see your stamp in the floor, in the foundation, because you're the one that built it. You make statements like, to him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, never to go out again. Well, that's builder's statements. I'm going to make a pillar and I'm going to place it here. You are the creator. You are God. You and the Father are one. And if we have you, we are one with you. So, Lord, I thank you for these revelations. I thank you for these simple understandings. I thank you for your word that tells us these things. Because without your word, we, we wouldn't know them. If your Bible did not exist right now, none of us would be in faith. We would be in some strange area that maybe might symbol symbolize it a little bit. But we wouldn't be where we need to be. It is only with your word we're able to learn these things. It is only with the Holy Spirit within us that confirms them that we're able to understand it. It is only because of you that we're able to have any of this in the first place. It's only because of you that we have salvation. Without you, we don't have salvation. If you were taken out of the equation at all, there is nothing. So that means that all things are nothing when compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And this is to glory and to the praise and honor of your holy name. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. I honestly didn't expect that to go the way it did, but um, I hope... I drove the point home. Without Christ, all of this is nothing. Everything we're doing here, it's nothing without Christ. It's nothing. It means nothing. It is nothing. All things are loss when compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And so the more we learn about him, the more we understand, the more we see, and the more this world becomes less to us and the more the next one becomes more to us. Because at some point, we're going to leave all this. Be it our appointed time to pass or be it the rapture, at some point, we're going to leave all this. We're going to leave it behind. And then the only thing that will be is him. The only thing that will be is heaven. The only thing that will be for us is the future. And that future has Christ all over it. Because without him, we have no future. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.